So, um, as a university, uh, we were uh, rather distributed on, in, in the town. We are a very old institution and we, we have several buildings in town, more than 200 actually. And um, so the tradition was uh, having scientific computing cluster uh, distributed all over the place. Uh, when I took uh, office, uh, we started consolidating into a, a single data center. So, by nature, we, we uh, started with a, a fragmented cluster uh, structure, but then we kept this structure uh, for the future because we found that we have very uh, different kind of users. Uh, and so with different classes, it's easy to maintain a reasonable size uh, when we have to run different software stacks. So network uh, is an important asset of the university. Uh, we uh, established our network that is fairly broad. Uh, we, we have more than 9,000 kilometers of uh, dark fiber. So we, uh, we use the, net, the, the network as a glue. So uh, as soon as uh, Ethernet has become uh, uh, a potential candidate for at least part of HPC workload. We started investing on our existing infrastructure to use Ethernet with low latency to perform scientific calculation. Digging a medieval time is difficult also because when you start digging it's pretty much sure that you will find some rest and and then you have, you know, uh, you get stopped because there is someone that has to check how relevant that thing is, etc. So um, we used the, we, we, we used robots that back in the 90s were fairly innovative to dig down. And so basically the robot digs, drills a hole under the ground and, and keeps the, the cables. And, and, and so this way we, we build the network. We even pass it. Uh, below the river. But it's true that <coughs> working uh, in IT in a medieval town is complicated. It puts a cap to the largest data center you can build. The, the scope of our uh, network uh, ranges from, it, it spans 80 kilometers, so we, we even reach uh, uh, near towns. Uh, so there is Pisa, there is Leghorn, uh, there is uh, the coast side, uh, and so it's fairly articulated and wide network. So if I look at uh, uh, clearly, Infinivent has been designed in the, in the HPC uh, space. Uh, Ethernet back then was simply not for the job. Uh, if I like, uh, Ethernet today has changed very much. There are uh, networking providers such as Dell Networking that provide uh, sub-microsecond switching. And this implies that uh, it can be a candidate, maybe it is not as efficient as Infinivent, but reasonable for many workloads. Uh, and so you have to maintain only one fabric instead of two fabrics, which is in general a good thing. Um, apart from that, uh, there is a, the large market of Ethernet that tends to bring costs down. Uh, uh, you get access to larger bandwidth uh, uh, at a reasonable cost, uh, much faster than a dedicated fabric that is HPC only. So in this respect, we've, we feel that uh, Ethernet for HPC is uh, broadening its applicability. Of course, if you're looking to go as fast as possible, probably is not yet there. So blades uh, uh, are, uh, so customers tend to use blades, to like blades. Blades are uh, as good because uh, they simplify cabling, they uh, simplify documentation, uh, they are sort of self-contained. Uh, you got uh, our grid management. Uh, so the blade was uh, rather, st still is rather popular uh, with customers. Uh, but vendors tend to move away from, from blades uh, for mostly one reason, that is the mid-plane. So the, the, bl uh, the blade is uh, uh, structured uh, in a way in which there is a, a front plane where you connect uh, the blades, so the, the compute, and the, the back plane uh, where you connect the fabric. And then there is the mid-plane that makes these two things uh, communicate. And it's difficult to design a, a mid-plane that will last 10 years as it was 10 years ago. And so uh, the cost equation in which you spend money for a chassis and the mid-plane and then you grow, you pay as you grow, is not uh, anymore there if you look at, the, at this approach because it's difficult to uh, build a mid-plane that is uh, future-proof. 
Um, it's interesting the uh, MX uh, blade from Dell because actually it was a smart uh, move to remove uh, the mid plane. So basically, uh, the blades uh, uh, insert mechanically into the uh, back plane, and so the geometry of pieces are made so in a way such that you can plug uh, the front and the back without something in, the, in, in between. And so basically uh, with the MX architecture you have a uh, conceptual blade but you remove this uh, potential bottleneck in between and, uh, and in fact uh, it's a successful product from Dell. We run both InfiniBand, Omnipath and Ethernet um, for various purposes. Um, unless uh, it's not necessary, we stick to Ethernet for cost reasons. Um, in Ethernet in particular, we use it uh, for east-west traffic that is increasing in bandwidth and it is getting more and more important with uh, the fact that uh, solid-state drives are getting faster and faster. So if we look at Obtain uh, from Intel and uh, other SSDs, uh, you got very low latency. So latency in the fabric becomes really important. And for this reason, uh, Ethernet is becoming uh, uh, more low latency and the bottleneck is basically the TCP protocol that runs on top of Ethernet. So um, we are running uh, most, most of our uh, uh, hyperconverged infrastructure by using RDMA, which is basically a protocol that allows you to uh, move data around at the low latency by passing the TCP IP stack, uh, by moving, uh, um, floating the CPU and uh, writing uh, on the memory of another physical host from a different host. Uh, and this is a very fast way to move data around. So that's probably the main application. And of, of course, if we have non really sensible, uh, latency sensible workloads, uh, we use it also for HPC. Latency has been a, a very important piece of HPC for so long time that we forget that what the reason is. So why this is so important is uh, it is basically because uh, the first HPC system were used for phys simulating physical systems. Uh, so you basically distribute a workload uh, and you segment the physical space you want to simulate. Uh, uh, and, and, and then uh, you, you perform a step of simulation, uh, but then uh, every node uh, should communicate the state of this part of the physics world to the other nodes. So the longer you wait for the response, the longer it will take the computation. So every single step should wait and then compute and wait and compute. And if latency is long, you will wait a lot. If I look at HPC today, uh, including AI, uh, for all the workloads that requires much more CPU between uh, two communications, uh, latency is not so important as it, as it was for the traditional HPC workloads because uh, basically uh, the potential overhead for communication is uh, uh, rare with respect to the time you spend for, for the CPU. And so in this respect we see that uh, it's getting less important uh, in some of the workloads. Uh, that are typically tied to nonlinear algorithms. So and we, so we see them in simulation, uh, statistical simulation in uh, um, biology and many other applications uh, where uh, the ratio between compute and communication is different than the traditional one. Obtain is, is something more than just a fast drive. Uh, it is a new solid state technology in its first uh, generation and iteration. It is called internally in Intel 3D Crosspoint um, and it's a different media than the traditional NAND we use for uh, implementing other solid state technologies. So uh, what makes uh, special uh, is the fact that uh, the latency for write and read is similar in general, in NAND uh, system, uh, writing costs you much more than reading. And the other part that is very relevant is that in its pure form, uh, uh, it is uh, basically only 10 times lower with respect to the memory. So uh, when a persistent media becomes so fast, uh, you have to start counting uh, the, the compute cycle of the PCI Express protocol, for instance, because uh, in terms of latency, you will spend much more waiting your turn in a, in, in a bus rather than uh, communicating. And 
For this reason, uh, the first iteration was PCI Express based, uh, but then Intel released a version that is a DIMM package. So basically, you can uh, uh, you have memory modules that are made of this uh, uh, new media, and they're persistent. And this brings uh, uh, basically more bandwidth and low la lower latency because uh, the persistent media is living uh, on the memory bus rather than uh, on the PCI Express bus. Networking uh, is changing very fast, so it's difficult to give advice because it really depends from where you start. So if you're still on one gigabit, please go on. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, the east-west traffic is dominating. Uh, you will need more and more bandwidth just to keep up with the business. So um, I think uh, that this is one way. If you're already in a data center, you probably are already on a spine and leaf architecture, which basically is uh, you uh, can modulate a pair of switches uh, to build uh, your in uh, interconnection instead of building a big chassis. So keep building clusters and, and basically pods, point of distribution in which uh, uh, you know the performance, you know the potential SLA if you're running a private cloud or a public cloud. And, uh, and then when you deploy a new one, you may uh, be future-proof by introducing uh, a more performing uh, gear, both for the fabric and for uh, the systems you're installing, because it's really difficult to um, to foresee how the, 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 the landscape will evolve. So if we look at the 25 gigabit, I mean, uh, it, it became basically on par with 10 uh, in so few times, so short time with respect to the previous iteration that probably no one would have expected that uh, they would have run on 100 gigabit and 25. And, and now we're already 400 and waiting for the 800, so. AI workload is, uh, it has different, so it is computer intensive. Um, it, it, it requires less communication with respect to the traditional HPC. It's, uh, it really depends on the kind of, because I mean, AI is a broad area that includes even logics. So, I mean, if we're talking about deep learning, which is the hype today, um, deep learning uh, depends on how, the, the size of the data you ingest into the uh, training process. So it is more data driven uh, with respect to other challenges because basically you, you ingest a lot of data, the system uh, uh, hopefully uh, converge into uh, a set of uh, parameters into the neural network and then you, you put into production. So it, it's difficult to, to tell, but the, the workload has different uh, characteristic with respect to the traditional, also in the form of the computation, because the computation is uh, largely vectorized, so you can have a lot of benefits in by using accelerators uh, to speed up that part of the computation, but this also involves uh, the structure of your server, because then eventually you will have to, to communicate with the CPU that is coordinating back and forward. So the fabric that connects the CPU to the uh, accelerators, whether they are GPUs uh, uh, or uh, uh, FPGAs or other, in any case, uh, you need to uh, be able to transfer data back and forth, and that can be a, a bottom. One API is this initiative that Intel announced uh, here at Supercomputing uh, about having uh, uh, a common infrastructure of API to express computation that are heterogeneous in nature, and so they may benefit by running on several different kind of accelerators, uh, ranging from GPUs, FPGAs, and many others. Uh, while retaining the, uh, the control over the computation and you can express the algorithms uh, uh, by annotating uh, where, I mean, the, the, the nature of the computation, whether it is uh, asynchronous, uh, it is distributed, parallel, or whatever it is. And then this layer basically reduces this to uh, the singular computation that and orchestrates the computation on uh, several devices. Thank you.